This video has been sponsored by Keeps. <laughs> Dante's Inferno is <laughs> a game that never fails to get my blood boiling. Now this might sound like I hate the game itself, but that's really not the case. Visceral Games 2010 video game adaptation of the first part of Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy has always been one of my favorite guilty pleasure titles that, while being aware of its many shortcomings, I unironically enjoy and relish to revisit quite regularly. The reason it gets my blood boiling is that it's next to impossible to discuss Dante's Inferno without being constantly reminded of two very aggravating things. Firstly, the history of Visceral Games, a studio that has repeatedly developed amazing games that feel great to play and attempted to elevate genre conventions to new heights, only to be run in the ground by publishers repeatedly and hard. Like how Electronic Arts pasteurized the wonderful Dead Space franchise into a half-baked Call of Duty knockoff and then canned it when people lost interest. Or how EA seriously did Dante's Inferno dirty with their juvenile marketing stunts? How the Amy Henning written and directed Star Wars adventure was smothered in the crib in 2017? By EA as well, until Visceral eventually got closed down in 2017? By EA as well, of course, because Electronic Arts concluded that people don't want single player games anymore. <sighs> it's just sad, bro. And secondly, it keeps reminding me how utterly incapable we used to be, and still are in so many ways, of discussing video games. Something that Dante's Inferno suffered horribly from, because it's painfully hard to find any contemporary criticism of the game that tries to evaluate it on its own terms. Something that is, in no small but not exclusive part, also thanks to electronic fucking arts and their unbelievable tone deafness in how they spread the word about it. Of course, I don't want to spend an entire video focusing on my wrath over the atrocious state of video game discourse and marketing around the early 2010s. Only someone had gathered an angry mob to protest the problems of video game journalism back then, eh? Now, if you know me a bit, you know that I'm here to tell you what I love about the game and what makes it worth your time. Before 2021, the 700th anniversary of Dante Alighieri's death is finished, I want to tell you why I think this game is, in many ways, an underrated and mistreated hack and slay horror gem, a highly creative, epic, mythological spectacle that still positively slaps. And also, why Dante's Inferno is actually a pretty genius adaptation into a video game by putting a handful of genuinely clever twists on the 700-year-old text it emulates. Twists that certainly got some literary nerds quite huff and puff about it at the time. Ironically, wonderfully in tune with the effect the original work had in its time. Alterations and changes that become sublime once you look at them not as inaccuracies, but as deliberate commentary, subtextual statements on the Inferno, realized in a way only interactive fiction is able to do. If this is you, I don't understand. Do you feel like the floor is breaking loose beneath your feet? Then let me be your Virgil on your journey through the nine layers of the infernal underworld. Before we go on, I'm glad to announce that Keeps has decided to sponsor this video, so let me show you what Keeps has to offer to you. Fact is, about two thirds of men will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. Maybe the shadow man look would suit you great, but if you feel like you'd rather do what you can to prevent losing your hair, the best time to act is now, like while you still have hair left. Enter our sponsor Keeps, it's a subscription service that provides you with licensed doctor reviews of your information online straight from home to distinguish the perfect hair loss treatment plan for you and then your treatment is shipped directly to your door every three months. Keeps treatments are fully FDA approved medications for hair loss and they're affordable generic versions. That's great for your wallet. Generic means once the expensive brand medications patents have run out, generic versions are the exact same medication just without the massive brand price overhead. You save a lot of money, plus you're able to message your Keeps doctor 24-7 with any questions and concerns you may have and track your progress with the provided progress tracking tool. 
So, if you decide you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash ragnaroks or click the link in the description to get 50% off your first order. That's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash ragnaroks with double R. So, thanks a lot again to our sponsor and now I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. As Dante Alieri awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed by Visceral Studios into a horrible crusader. <laughs> well, okay, this is not actually how the story begins. The tale of Dante's Inferno, the video game, doesn't start with a bastardized Kafka quote, but with the famous opening line of the first of the three chapters of the Divine Comedy. Longfellow translation. At the midpoint on the journey of life, I found myself in a dark forest. For the clear path was lost. I've played this game many times and probably replayed the first hours more than 20 times by now, and I found the entire opening segment more fascinating each time I went through it. In many ways, it's a microcosm of what the entire game is about, especially regarding how Visceral Studios chose to approach the adaptation of the literary work it's based on. See, if they would have chosen to adapt the Inferno as painstakingly close as possible, it would have likely become a, I hate the term, walking simulator. Or like a walking and talking simulator. Or like a walking and talking and hiding behind Virgil simulator. The protagonist Dante in the original work was a pilgrim who found himself in a dark forest at the midway point of his life being called upon by angels to enter the very gates of hell, accompanied at all times by the, at the time, long deceased Roman writer and poet Virgil. Dante is basically being led straight through hell, observing all of its different, vividly drawn out layers and their inventive methods of eternal torture rarely actively intervening, sometimes fainting and skipping to the next layer, and eventually ending up at the transition to the purgatory, taking with him the deep epiphany that there is no pity to be had for the billions of souls who are damned to horrible eternal suffering down here, since all of this is just and good and the way the Lord wills it. Dante's Inferno, the game, on one hand, goes to great lengths to adapt and draw out passages of the many and varied descriptions of hell Dante witnesses on his journey with as much accuracy as humanly possible, sometimes going so far that it even feels like things have been added solely to boast closeness to the prose. While, on the other hand, in a thousand different ways, the writers took endless liberties by turning the whole thing inside out, rearranging and reinterpreting the source material into a funhouse mirror reflection of itself. This goes down to how the whole plot unfolds, its core messages and ideological implications, as well as the interpretation of central characters, including the protagonist Dante himself. And you know how it is. Adapt any piece of media into a different medium and anything that's altered will get people riled up in no time, often just for the audacity of changing stuff in the first place. But here I am claiming that if you adapt a 700 year old text that implies that being gay is a worse sin than committing literal genocide into a video game of all things, that rethinking and changing lots of things about it can actually be a good thing. Your soul is free. Game Dante and his very journey is in many ways the complete antithesis to book Dante. We start out in the same dark forest the Divine Comedy begins in, which feels like a dutiful nod to the original work, but immediately we're being torn out of the illusion that this is going to be a pedantically faithful adaptation. We witness Dante sewing a cross-shaped linen tapestry directly on his chest, like strings through his skin and all. <laughs> This embroidery bears depictions of, as we find out over the course of the game, his personal history, memories, and especially the sins he carries with him and has yet to realize. In a vividly hand-drawn animated flashback, we see violent, frenzied battle scenes of crusaders clashing with Saladin's army, prisoners being taken and eventually culminating in an outbreak in the city of Acre. This is where the sequence seamlessly transitions into the first active gameplay scene where we take direct control of Dante, who then goes on to slaughter literal swaths of underfed prisoners in the middle of a breakout attempt. Which, yeah. If I had to write a five word review for this game, it would be, it is a video game. Duh. The medium is really the message here. 
And it's fascinating to me how much of what I used to find odd to irritating about this game, but which I've come to admire more and more over time for reasons I'm gonna go into across the length of this video, is wonderfully explained with it is a video game. A very of its time 2010 AAA high octane epic action slasher console game. Because let's face it, most people at the time hadn't bought this game because they expected a pensive, contemplative, narrative walking simulator. But what was promised was epic, sprawling, mythological hack and slay. Well, here you go. The button prompts tell you what to do, so slaughter away. Does it feel good, what you're doing here? Does it feel right? Not the slightest bit of dissonance over what you're doing here without questioning it? Mmm, yes, power fantasy, chopping down waves of half-starved brown people while bearing the great cross of the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, aka the Knights Templar. Where the original text was, in broad strokes, a pilgrimage in the name of God that consisted of mostly walking, talking, observing, and occasionally asking everyone what's going on in Dante's hometown of Florence. No, like, really, every time Dante and his mentor and companion Virgil face some potential adversity, he goes, yeah. Well, me and the Lord, we got an understanding. We're on a mission from God. And the problems just take care of themselves on their own. Video game Dante bears the weight of many a sin committed in the name of the Holy Roman Church and fights virtually every step of the way into and down through the entire path of hell. Okay, from time to time he also climbs and platforms in vague Prince of Persia fashion and solves the occasion of puzzle, but you get my meaning. His pilgrimage is a gauntlet of adversity and interestingly also an introspective journey of realizing the numerous sins he's committed without ever understanding he did so. Yeah, the game's story puts a heavy emphasis on the unaccountable evils perpetrator under the supposed impunity imbued by powerful leaders of the Holy Roman Church, who instrumentalized armies of faithful warriors into committing the worst atrocities imaginable in the name of God. And so, after this opening massacre on the shores of Acre, Dante is met with karmic justice in the form of a dagger in the spine, which he nonchalantly pulls out before he's immediately greeted by everyone's favorite Discworld character. Dante, your fate is decided. Everlasting damnation for your sins. But that's not possible. The bishop assured us. Come, face eternity. Soon you'll be joined by those whose lives you have ruined, whose souls you have damned. I will not let my sins damn those dear to me. The Grim Reaper himself has come to take Dante's soul, but our crusader won't have it. And so he answers him with cold, hard steel. In the first boss battle, we not only get to tear death himself in two halves while they beg for mercy... No! No! Please! We even get to snatch their legendary scythe and make it our new signature instrument of war. Okay, so this might be considered an early spoiler, but hey, I'm going through the entire game anyway, so I always found it so extremely obvious that, like, Dante of course has died at the point where he's stabbed in the back by the assassin, but he is absolutely and completely unaware of his demise. And his utter cluelessness about everything, really, is probably my absolute favorite aspect about Dante in this game as a character. Just like, uh, for instance, I will always associate Sam with his catchphrase, You crack me up, little buddy. Dante to me is firmly imprinted with his battery of bewildered facial expressions when shouting, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. He's really the perfect embodiment of someone who means well. But he's so blind and ignorant, firmly in the grips of a faith war machinery that brainwashed him into the perfect tool of dogmatic imperialism. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. 
And yeah, his entire redemptive arc through hell is really about first realizing, understanding and eventually accepting the transgressions he's committed during his lifetime. But at this point in the story, Dante still has both feet firmly planted in the conviction that he successfully defied death. And so he travels back to his hometown of Florence to find his homestead ravaged and his fiancée Beatrice, in good old gladiator style, slain right in front of his house. But Beatrice's soul is not allowed to rest. It emerges from her corpse and is whisked away into the darkness by none other than Lucifer himself. Beatrice! It is a video game, and here's Dante's damsel in distress and Cass's belly that lends him the determination to slice and dice every single thing in his path to redeem his lover's soul from being punished for his transgressions. This is actually one of the fiercest criticisms I kept reading, especially from academic circles about Visceral's adaptation of the Divine Comedy. Quote, Beatrice saves Dante, not the other way around, that's the whole point! And I'm like, I get you, Teodolino Barellini, that is the initial setup of the game's narrative. This is what it seems like to the player, and especially to Dante at this point of the story. But I gotta say, for the former president of the Dante Society of America, you're either not very good, or more likely surprisingly uninterested in exploring the game's subtext, or in actually seeing the entire story play out to the end. You probably don't even believe that something like Subtix is a consideration for a subpar medium such as video games. <laughs> See, while your interpretation of the plot is superficially what happens, if you just pay a little bit of attention, it's next to impossible over the course of the game to completely miss out on the fact that Beatrice is way more than just a MacGuffin for Dante to hunt after, because she really has a plan all along. While Dante, well, he's... I don't understand! But for now, let's dog-ear this page and come back to it later, and instead continue on Dante's quest to hell. Because damn, we're not even in hell yet, so let's do some crime to get there faster. Dante's Inferno was initially released on the seventh console generation for the Xbox 360 and the PS3. If you want to acquire it these days, your only options are to find a physical copy from a reseller with prices in recent years rapidly soaring thanks to increased scalper scum activity. If you own an Xbox 360 copy, the Xbox One luckily added this game as a backwards compatible title, so you can play it on the next bone. It's also available digitally in the Xbox Store for around 15 US dollars and luckily playable both on the Xbox One as well as the Series S and X, according to my research. But these versions are really nothing but expensive emulation, if we're completely honest. So if you already own it, and you're in possession of a somewhat capable mid-range PC, there's really no reason not to get the most out of it. I don't really see any purism argument for a 3D game that natively runs in 720p when amping its rendering up to 1080p or hey, even up to 8K resolutions if you have the technical means and add features like anisotropic filtering and anti-lighting, right? And would you look at that? That's exactly what the RPSC3 PlayStation 3 emulator allows you to do. The footage you see in this video was recorded with this emulator on 7 year old PC hardware. It runs smoothly start to finish and is a real treat for the eyes. I truly never get tired of the leap in visual fidelity, amped up resolution, a bit of advanced smoothing and texture filtering emulators can bring to 3D games from the PS2 and upwards eras. So for anyone interested in running their legally owned copy with an emulator, I provided a document with how to get it set up and running in the RPSC3 PS3 emulator for yourself. You will as always find the link in the description of this video. And if you don't own the game but still want to emulate it, hey, it's factually not illegal to go and emulate it. I've actually added a paragraph on the legal status of emulation and quote unquote video game preservation piracy in the emulation document if you're interested and the money you'd spend buying it goes either to resellers or to EA, the ones who ran visceral games in the ground in the first place, and who are planning to get big time into NFT gaming now. Ugh. So the people who made the game itself won't ever see a nickel of it anyways. You don't know how empowering it is to be able to say to yourself, yes, I am a despicable, filthy, villainous pirate, deserving blame and censure, but that pirate is who I want to be. So, you might think twice if you want to put your money in their pockets, just saying, I'm not a cop. Oh, crap. So, 
So with Beatrice, and now even myself, dragged away to hell, Dante really has no more excuses not to search straight after us. He makes his way to the chapel on the little foothill behind the graveyard where Beatrice's soul appears to him once more, lamenting how Dante has betrayed her trust by breaking his sacred promise to stay faithful to her during his time in the Crusades. He, though, has no fucking clue what she's talking about. He believes himself free of guilt as he always, as it turns out, acted under blanket absolution passed on to the Crusaders by the Archbishop. At this point in the story, we don't find out exactly what he did, but it dawns on him that it really might have been his actions that condemned her to hell. So Dante takes up her holy cross and vows to not give in until her soul is freed. In contrast to the poem, where Beatrice merely appears to him as an angel before the gates of hell, informing him that he has a holy quest to traverse the underworld ordained by God himself, game Dante's journey is far more Orphean in nature. I've always quite enjoyed this twist, to be honest. The game also consciously acknowledges this a little bit later. Like, that it's a conscious riff on the Orpheus myth, not that, like, I enjoy it. They couldn't have known that ahead of time now, could they? At this moment, the ground shatters and breaks apart, swallowed up by the fiery pits of hell unveiling the gates to the underworld beyond. This is one of my favorite moments in the game, honestly. It's just breathtakingly staged and directed, and a perfect example for two of my favorite aspects of this take on the Divine Comedy, spectacle and music. Dante's Inferno is probably one of the coolest depictions of hell in a video game, up there with Bayonetta and Doom 3. Especially in the first half, the game keeps bombarding players with an abundance of sprawling creativity and epic set pieces, and it's accompanied by one of the most impressive video game soundtracks I've come across. Interestingly though, it's a score that I rarely feel like listening to outside of playing the game itself, because it so perfectly works in tandem with what's unfolding on screen moment by moment. Much of this gargantuan pandemonium we witness on screen is so tightly interwoven with the intense and bombastic orchestration that it almost makes the music an integral diegetic element of the play. And epic opera unfolding before our eyes as we're watching and playing it as the audience. This interplay between bombast orchestration, epic renditions of hell, cinematic interactive camera work and the hyperkinetic over-the-top hack-and-slay action that still smacks, it keeps having me come back again and again. After fighting our way down we eventually arrive at the gates of hell themselves, which Alright, let me be nitpicky here. With all the alibi, I've done my homework, fan service elements that the developers put all over the game, I was a bit sad that it didn't feature the iconic abandon all hope ye who enter quote that's embossed into the stone frame of the gates in the poem. But hey, Shogunai. Then again, this famous expression in essence embodies the central idea of the book really that you should not wish for things to improve for the people stuck down here because everything happening in hell is already in accord with God's perfect plan, which is righteous and good. We have that. And this notion, as I already hinted at, was drastically subverted by the game adaptation. Again, more on that later, but when I'm starting to overthink things like this, I wonder if they might have even omitted it for that very reason. I wouldn't put it past Visceral, this game certainly gets far less credit for clever subtext than it deserves in many areas. Anyway, the gates themselves are sealed, but luckily we encounter Virgil. In the Divine Comedy, Virgin is Dante's constant companion and guide. He really is essentially his skeleton key, completely leading him by the hand, deflecting nearly all adversity, and at the same time serving as the main vessel for exposition, tour guide and bodyguard in one. In the game, his role is rather limited to mostly the latter function. Dante fights his way down the layers of hell on his own, while we regularly encounter Virgil standing in front of new areas to give us a little sermon on what part of hell we're about to enter and who's being tortured here for what reason most of the time. And I'm definitely not the only one who finds this rather reserved involvement in the journey a bit disappointing given how central of a role he played in the original text. 
Like, placing the Roman writer and poet Virgil in his own poem was definitely a form of wish fulfillment for Dante Alighieri, himself a great admirer of his work and fame, and with the Divine Comedy he basically wrote fan fiction about Virgil being his sidekick and great admirer. But it makes me think, how could he have been involved in his sprawling hack and slash type gameplay as more than just a hotspot tour guide? I mean, Dante and Virgil in co-op mode, double dragoning their way through the nine circles of hell, that could have been pretty awesome. Hmm. Anyway, Virgil agrees to guide us on our journey in return for the favor to, should we manage to reach our goal, convince Beatrice to put in a good word for him in heaven. Because he's had the bad luck of having been born before Christianity was even invented, so he never even had a chance to be baptized, and according to God's infallibly fair laws of hell, every unbaptized soul ends up in the first circle of hell, Limbo, our first stop after the big plunge we take beyond the gates. So yeah, Limbo is the place where everyone who was not baptized and even everyone who could never even possibly have had the chance to be baptized in their lifetime ends up as punishment for being born in the wrong time, circumstances, or body. Like, even babies who died before they could have been baptized, yet yeah, even stillborn babies, they all end up in hell. And incidentally, they're also one of the more unnerving enemies we meet down here. Makes sense though, seriously, who can fault them for being severely pissed off. The first area we make our way across is the river Acheron, which separates the underworld from the world of the living. All souls destined to go further down the hellscape than Limbo have to cross on their journey to the respective destinations on a great ferry captained by the mythological figure of Charon. To anyone who's a bit confused by this, yes, this is completely true to the original text. Many elements in Alieri's depiction of hell are a mashup of various mythological inspirations, predominantly Greek and Roman, interspersed with ideas and concepts from actual Christian mythology, to form the strange pastiche of Dante's nine circles of hell. As I said, this is Christian fanfiction. I absolutely love those panoramic wide-angle shots with gaping mouths aggressively vomiting an endless waterfall of screaming souls plunging into nothingness. Hordes of lost souls who have abandoned all hope, waiting in line to board the vessel that brings them to their final and eternal destination. I distinctly remember how the book described Dante's first distinctive acoustic impression when entering hell, which was the sound of one shapeless, never-ending blend of millions and billions of souls perpetually screaming in agony. And these wailing walls, as I call them, the damned climb as the game calls them, these scalable webs made of lattices and constantly screaming souls writhing in eternal torment, such an astoundingly cool way of realizing the images those words put in my mind when I read the Divine Comedy in school for the first time. Never get tired of this. But yeah, in the poem, Charon is an old ferryman on a rather small boat similar to more classic depictions from Greek mythology. Though he initially refuses them passage when Virgil goes, We're on a mission from God. He relents and just takes them across. In the game. Through me. Well, in the game, as you can see, the ferryman actually is the very ferry itself. Oops, this sounds weird. And since he also denies us access, albeit in a somewhat more brusque fashion, plus we don't have Virgil to solve our problems for us, we have to fight our way atop of the poop deck, and then capture and take control of a giant minotaur and fucking tear the boatsman's head off and toss it in the water. I don't think Dante is yet aware that violence is its own later hell, later down the line. And after a frenetic hijacking sequence, we arrive on the shores of the underworld, not gently, but rather while tearing the place apart in the process of landing. So yeah, technically, it is only now that we truly enter Limbo. Limbo, from the Latin word limbus, meaning border, is one of the places where Alieri placed a lot of characters that he was an ardent fan of. Because luckily for his narrative cohesion, many of his personal historic idols were, of course, unbaptized, like Homer, Horace, Ovid, and Lucan, all esteemed Greek and Roman poets who rejoice when they spot him and are ecstatic to welcome the great writer Dante into their esteemed literary company. 
they basically don't stop blowing smoke up his ass for his incredible writing skills for a good while. The scene has sadly not been adapted, but Visceral themselves took the opportunity of Limbo to include characters that underlined their own take on the Inferno just as well. And that's a great opportunity to talk about one of the game's central and most interesting mechanics, the punish and absolve binary branching. On our journey, we regularly encounter lonely lost souls that the game prompts us to, much in line with the creed of the Holy Crusaders, judge, jury and execute in one fell swoop. For instance, the first one we encounter before the gates of the river Acheron is Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who presided over the trial and execution of Jesus Christ. Or not too long after that, aboard Charon's ferry we find, as I already teased it, Orpheus, the Greek mythological figure whose journey into the underworld to rescue his lover Eurydice is in many ways so strikingly similar to Dante's in this game. And we are given the choice to either absolve or punish him for his misdeeds of looking back at the edge of the underworld which accidentally condemned his lover to eternal damnation. When we chose to punish, Dante shoves a blade in their throats which dissolves them and apparently condemns them to eternal suffering, while absolving makes us play this little mini-game where we have to press the controller buttons in the right moments to catch and absolve their sins. The more we get, the higher the bonus XP reward. It's basically a rhythm game, but without any music for some reason. Seriously, it keeps baffling me with the constant gorgeous orchestration of the game that these segments are completely silent all of a sudden. This would have been a perfect opportunity to turn Hell into a regular Project Diva. <laughs> But depending on which option we choose, we gain different categories of experience points that fill up either the holy or the unholy skill tree. It is a video game. This binary progression system also extends to the combat. Weaker minion enemies and larger opponents, such as the horned guardian demons, once their health is low enough, can be executed with either punish or absolve finishing moves that yields a boost in the respective skill tree. So depending on how you fare, this progression shapes Dante's combat and magic abilities into different specializations which can heavily influence your moveset and your play and combat style. Generally speaking, holy skills focus more on protection, binding and emphasizing Beatrice's cross. The cross is basically your distance weapon, holding it in front of you like Van Helsing makes it shoot glowing crucifixes at your opponents. The unholy skills, on the other hand, put a stronger emphasis on aggressiveness, carnage, the breaking of cover and stunning enemies in place. Generally a more a visceral style of combat. I actually really enjoy this theme progression system because especially in higher difficulties where plain button mashing will have you dead in a heartbeat, you have to intuitively learn the combos at your fingertips and use them strategically to persist, like a good hack and slash game should make you do. And if you enjoy the combat of the game enough for it to keep you going, which is the case for me, this really gives it quite a bit of replay variety. But honestly, I'm quite often a subtext over gameplay kind of guy, and what I find far more interesting about this mechanic is what it narratively implies, especially in light of the game being an adaptation of the Divine Comedy, in which the protagonist was given no such powers. But once more, I can only brush on that here and get back to that at a later point once we've explored the story and themes of the game a little more in depth. But yeah, initially I kept wondering why even would Dante, who's literally going through all nine circles of hell because it turned out he pretty much committed all of them in some form, pretty impressive actually if you ask me, why would he of all people be granted the power slash privilege to judge over people deciding the fate of their immortal souls in the first place? It felt weirdly uncalled for, but the more I thought about it, the more it started to make sense in a weird and ironic way. See, technically, this is precisely what Dante Alighieri, the writer of the original story himself, did when he placed Dante, the main character and self-insert, in his story, conjured up his vivid, elaborative picture of eternal damnation and then put real people in there. Like he, for instance, as I've said, came up with all kinds of justifications for historic and mythological people he personally admired to be down here for the sole sake of telling him what an amazing writer he is. He also added historic as well as mythological figures he personally despised or ideologically or politically disagreed with in here, condemning them to various circles of hell according to his personal judgment of their sins. Yet yeah, he even wrote actual, real, at the time living people that he felt like condemning for personal reasons in here. Kinda like 
nah, this guy sucks, you're damned, and you're gonna spend the rest of your sorry existence in hell, fuck you. And then to put the dollop of cream on top of it all, he possessed the hubris and audacity to have his protagonist Dante reach the peak of religious enlightenment by coming to the blissful epiphany that, yep, everything that's happening down here until the end of time, the very people the writer Dante placed in here on his own whim, this is all perfect and fair just the way it is. Unquestionable divine justice. Abandon hope, you I tossed in here. So yeah, Alieri's cantons are not an interactive medium, and within the range of his three-part comedy, the medium he chose, he absolutely ended up playing the punish or absolve game with his choices of which characters he put in hell, purgatory, and heaven. So if you really think about it, Video game Dante is in so many ways almost the perfect antithesis to this. The game flips the entire central meaning of the Inferno on its head and says, hey, we're adapting this thing into an interactive medium? Well then it's not on Monsignore Alieri anymore, but on you, the player, to decide who shall soldier and who shall exalt. No, please! I'll be the Plus, you get sick new battle combos as a reward. What's not to love? It's pretty genius, if you ask me. At the end of the plane of Limbo, true to the original text, we encounter Minos, another character from Greek mythology. Former king of Crete, son of all-humping Zeus and Europa, who, after his death, became judge of the dead in the underworld. He serves a similar purpose in Alieri's poem as he does in the game. Any soul that arrives here after traversing limbo must stand before his gaze and nostrils and confess their sins, after which he wraps his monstrous tail around them and sends them off to the circle that best befits their transgressions. When Dante steps before him, though, he's first like, You shall not pass! Initially wanting to stop him, since he's a living soul. Where are you? Now, as before, where in the poem, this is again swiftly solved by Virgil stepping in with, You see, we're on a mission from God. Which Minos replies, oh, well, well, okay, that if it's like that, then I guess you can pass. In the video game, Minos is the first major boss battle after the duel with death in the very beginning. And honestly, mechanically it's the first time it really feels like a proper boss battle in that it's a towering behemoth before you whose attack and behavioral patterns you have to learn while you use the environment against him to defeat him in a big, gory violence galore. <laughs> Once we've defeated Minos, we take a scenic stroll past a cliff decorated in a way that would make Vlad Dracul himself feel right at home, and then descend into the second layer of hell, Lust, aka Horny Jail. The place where souls who, you know, engaged in ludity and such in their lifetime end up. The sufferers here are being tossed around in a gargantuan, perpetually roaring thunderstorm, kind of symbolic for how we've been tossed around so wildly and uncontrollably by fleshly desires in our mortal days and now have to experience that for eternity, like turn to 11. Symbolic. This is definitely a chapter where the video game heavily expanded on the events of the poem. In the original work, it uh, climaxes in Dante being moved by pity for those suffering down here, meeting and talking with the soul of Francesca da Rimini, the real-life daughter of the lord of the province of Ravenna during Dante's lifetime. Another person who Alieri pretty much literally condemned to hell in his work because she had an affair with her husband's brother, which resulted in her husband killing them both. So she deserves to go to hell, apparently. Anyway, after this conversation, Dante faints because he's so moved by her torment and, whoops, wakes up in the third circle. In the game, Francesca does appear, but only briefly as one of those characters we can either punish or absolve for their sins. So, absolve it is, of course. But after that, the chapter of our hardcore crusader Dante doesn't end in gentle swooning, napping and teleporting to the next layer, but we have to climb the carnal tower reigned by Cleopatra. Yep, the 
Cleopatra, anointed mistress of the Circle of Lust in the game. And you can probably see where this is going. The Lust layer being extended like that was definitely a decision that played into the hands of the very pubescent marketing and audience targeting of this game as a true adult game for real grown-ups because Visceral really doesn't hold back here with over-the-top sexual imagery. Beatrice, with her externally exposed mommy milkers, begins a slow transformation to a succubus. The circle's architecture is littered with obviously vaginal and uh, boobinal shapes all over the place, and the fight with Cleopatra itself is just so grotesquely over-sexualized. And don't get me wrong, nothing against a tasteful application of horniness in a depiction of the underworld to get the uh, creative juices flowing. But in Dante's Inferno, it often tends to feel like the cheap, exploitative, gonzo porn idea of lust clearly and obtusely targeted at a rather immature, straight male audience. Now, I'm gonna try and give a bit of a lukewarm defense of these choices here, although this one is an aspect where I'm always pretty clear on my stance that anybody who finds especially this circle of hell just tasteless and off-putting, something that would keep him from enjoying the game, hey, all power to you. As I mentioned before, the best way I've found to enjoy this is like watching a really corny, overblown bad movie. Something like Street Fighter, the movie. Which isn't actually a bad movie, but you know what I mean. To me, the game makes this possible because it has just the necessary amount of self-awareness, especially around here. These segments are simply so ridiculously overblown that I can just enjoy them with a hearty laugh just for how absurdly grotesque they are. And a thing that I've kept thinking more and more about in regards to the game's purposefully provocative nature, and I'm really completely omitting the absolutely tasteless and childish marketing stunts performed by EA around the launch of the game, trying to judge it as good as I can on its own merit, you really have to put into perspective how absolutely and unbelievably provocative and scandalous Alieri's Inferno was when he released it. Like, you know the effect when you read a horror story that's like 150 years old, expecting a good spook, and then the most frightening thing that happens is some dude hearing weird sounds and it turns out it was a gorilla escape from the zoo or something. Stuff that barely even raises an eyebrow with modern, overstimulated and completely desensitized readers. The Inferno was released a whole 700 years ago, but its plentiful display of inventive and highly graphic depictions of tortures and torments start to finish are something that still gives readers these days pause. Spine-chilling stuff that sticks with you for long after reading it, so you just have to extrapolate how incredibly appalling and distressing it was on its audience at the time. Especially as it was not written in Latin, but in Italian, deliberately made to be populistic, read and spread among the common folk. So if you want to adapt this work in tone and texture, especially when it comes to the effect it had on its contemporary audiences, but for a modern, carnally overstimulated audience, you absolutely have to go all out. Which is precisely what Visceral attempted to do. And while it, of course, didn't manage to have a comparable cultural impact as the original, at least they've managed to establish unforgettable impressions such as Cleopatra's unbaptized baby secreting honkers and dangling from Lucifer's giant in <laughs> that's frequently mentioned memorable moments whenever the game's brought up. That is something at least, isn't it? When Andrei Tarkovsky, and no, I'm not going to compare this game to Stalker here, no worries, even I got some pride. Although if you think about the ephemeral nature of the zone, a place where the laws of nature are fundamentally rescinded to a quasi-mythological preternatural state, the journey the three deuteragonists undertake to find their true inner selves in essence is extremely similar to the journey Dante undertakes. When Andrei Tarkovsky released his adaptation of Stanislav Lem's Solaris, a lot of viewers and critics showed disappointment with how arduously slow the first third of the movie felt, to which Tarkovsky commented that he made the first hour boring on purpose in order to get the idiots out of the theater before getting to the good stuff. Dante's Inferno suffers a bit from the opposite problem, and that's not entirely the game's own fault. See, we've only made it through two circles of hell so far, and there are still seven left to descend through. But in many ways, the opening two or three hours are so intensely opulent with rich and sensory overloading impressions, 
In short, the game set the bar so high in the first quarter that it noticeably struggles to surpass itself the further we progress. The fact that some of the conceptually most um, tantalizing and eye-catching parts of Hell are front, or well, top-loaded if you will, by the source material itself doesn't really help. It feels a bit like the game has unloaded the lion's share of its creative juices in an intense sprint up front, like the game blew its load at the lust layer. <laughs> Especially towards the lower layers, it starts feeling like the creative batteries were a bit depleted, but we'll get to that. The fact that this feeling unquestionably arises here and there when playing through the story is a shame, because most of the segments we traverse are still awesome problems just that they now compete with the precedent established by earlier sequences of the very game itself. The third layer is a fantastic example. Right here at the entrance of the Circle of Gluttony, where Cerberus, the three-headed hound of the Greek underworld, guards the entrance. In the original poem, this roadblock is once again promptly solved by God Mode Virgil who tosses some dirt into his mouth. While in the game, Cerberus is more like a giant, snarling, three-headed worm or maybe symbolizing tapeworms who cause endless hunger in the people who subjected to the gluttony layer, your guess is as good as mine. And of course, we're also on our own, so we have to fling the dirt into Cerberus' mouth ourselves, and then rodeo each head individually in a frenetic quick-time sequence that culminates in a trinity of violent decapitations. It's a pretty cool boss fight that opens the path to the rest of the layer. Gluttony is comprised of bubbling lakes filled with screaming souls perpetually drowning and being digested in bile. Sufferers in this layer are punished for living in ridiculous abundance and excess, especially at the expense of others. We're traversing putridly organic architecture that makes us feel like we're passing through the innards of a vast creature ridden with worms and constantly plagued by acid rains as we fight giant blobbish glutton creatures with hungrily chomping mouths for hands and feet. It's easily one of the most gnarly and conceptually impressive circles, even if the glutton enemy type certainly has a bit of unnecessary fat phobia baked into its design. It's... it is what it is. Like Sartre famously said, hell is other people being fat phobic. Down here we learn how Beatrice and Dante's father Aliero passed away, which is revealed to be by the hands of the same assassin that stabbed Dante back in Acre, who Dun, 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 turns out to be the husband of the captive prisoner Dante is also revealed to have slept with for a favor. It keeps fascinating me how firmly convinced Dante was of his own righteousness and innocence despite having repeatedly betrayed his betrothed and his conviction in so many clear and obvious ways. But hey, that's what we're down here for, so onwards the road goes. We eventually reach the fourth circle of hell, Greed, which harbors spendthrifts and money hoarders. This place is guarded by the Roman god of the underworld, Pluto, blocking our path once more. The greed layer consists of lakes and waterfalls of molten gold in which sinners are being cooked alive. The passages themselves contain some of the most annoying time-critical puzzles featuring mechanical contraptions with demons storming at us while we try to figure out the solutions. When met with Pluto once again in the book, Virgil simply exclaims that We're on a mission from God. And the underworld guardian immediately falls over and makes way. While in the game, we have to solve another somewhat contrived puzzle that technically spans across the entire layer and results in a high octane minotaur hijacking and climbing session to ultimately tear the place apart. Yeah, violence is always the best solution, isn't it? After overcoming Pluto's roadblock, the circle culminates in a plot-twisty boss fight with none other than the deformed soul of Dante's own father. He's down here for his excessive greed, wealth hoarding and power mongering during his lifetime, and Dante slowly but surely comes to some fundamental revelations about his own past and self. Oh! You think you're a better man than your father? I think I am too much the same man as my father. Then we'll find out who's the better man. This is another place where the game clearly, not just nudges, but firmly punches in your face that the central notion of Dante's introspective journey is understanding that the better man is the man who can earnestly reflect on his own flaws, accept his mistakes, and repent and become a better person for it. Which is ultimately the very thing that grants Dante the privilege to absolve his father because his motivation for the crusade through hell is not selfish, but purely altruistic in nature. Oh. 
The fifth layer, Anger, brings some very interesting alterations to the source material that feel more like extensions to the story to make it work better in this pack and slay narrative epic format. Both in the poem as well as in the game, the first half consists of ascending the Tower of Wrath. In the poem they meet Phlegius, another ferryman who in this case transports souls across the river Styx. The two traverse the river on his boat, and at this point Halieri included one of those writerly judgement calls I talked about earlier. He included Filippo Argenti, a contemporary Florentine politician and rival of the Alieri family who publicly opposed Dante's return from exile. Not hard to guess that the writer wasn't very fond of him, and so he put him down here in hell among those drowning in the river Styx for eternity. During their traversal, Filippo boards the ferry and challenges Dante, to which he responds by pushing him back into the river while cursing him, which results in Argenti being torn into pieces by the other wrathful. Filippo Argenti also appears in the game as one of the souls we can appropriately decide to punish or resolve. It's up to you. Here in the game as well, we cross the river Styx, albeit on a floating platform that takes us to the opposing bank, which upon landing is revealed to be the head of Phlegius, in this iteration of the story embodied by a massive, fiery demon, who of course we have to defeat and outsmart in a confrontation. And once we've defeated him, we actually hijack him. We take control over him, similar to how it works with the Minotaurs before, just several levels more colossal, and on his head we violently force our entry into the city of Dis, which in the poem is the area that contains all the three last layers of hell. I'm a bit sad that this segment was cut somewhat short in the game, a bridge collapses under our feet and Dante successfully wingsuits far down into the next layer, this could have easily culminated in a grand and amazing kaiju battle a la Godzilla vs Gigan or something. All the mechanics for this were already in place, but the game chose to cut these segments short instead. Oh well. The encounter in the city of Dis in the poem is very different, and it's equally a bit sad that none of these events have been adapted in the game. As the duo arrives at the city, the gates are barred to them, and the inhabitants threaten them with the petrifying gaze of Medusa. Could have also been a cool boss battle. This is the only time where a simple We're on a mission from God doesn't immediately Deus Ex Virgil are the problem. In this case, it requires the intervention of an angel to come down from heaven and to diss the citizens of this into submission, so that Dante can continue on its divine journey. The strong divergence of game story and source material continues through the sixth circle heresy up until the seventh layer of violence, where it gets a bit more interesting again. In the poem, heresy is an ideologically really pivot layer because the sin of worshipping other quote-unquote false gods and idols was a much more weighty transgression back in the times when the Divine Comedy was conceived compared to today. These days, almost anyone's knee-jerk response to, oh, so people down here are being tortured because they were aware of the Catholic Church's existence but chose a different path or no faith at all, is gonna be blanket absolution. So delightful. The layer itself, true to the source material, is a network of burning tomes. Here, they're arranged in the probably most Metroidvania-style level in the entire game. I mean, not really Metroidvania, mostly in that it involves mechanisms and dead ends that clear the path in places we've been to so far, so like it's not a 3D symphony of the night all of a sudden, but considering that the game so far has almost exclusively been structured linearly forward or downward, it is a noticeable shakeup. So much so that you can feel how QA had to step in during testing and urge the developers to prompt some pop-ups here and there that indicate that the way forward for once is actually to go back. One of the most common criticisms I hear pointed out when it comes to Dante's Inferno, aside from the constant claims that it's similar to God of War and therefore somehow bad, which is about as valid criticism as saying like Star Wars Dark Forces is a bad video game because it's like Doom. It's just an asinine way of rating video games, especially when we're considering how the God of War series has built at least as strongly upon the foundations laid by Devil May Cry, ironically another title inspired by the Divine Comedy, this avenue of criticism can seriously go fuck right off. Anyway, I'm getting horribly distracted down here. It's like the further down I climb the ladder of hell, the more my mind starts wandering into places. So yeah, what I was saying, right. One of the most common valid criticisms I hear pointed out when it comes to Dante's Inferno is that the last, mm, I'd say the last quarter or so of the game is where it starts getting a bit out of breath creatively. And I totally get 
where people are coming from. There's really very little I can do to refute that, especially the eighth layer, we'll get there soon, which absolutely feels like a creative cop-out. At this point, the game's issues with pacing in the last circles comes at least in part from the original poem's structure and the order in which Alieri arranged the circles and their content himself. The seventh circle of hell, violence, is separated into three individual sublayers, while the eighth layer, fraud, is split into no less than ten different trenches, all dedicated to different manifestations of the sin of fraud, which seriously scrambles the so far rather neatly spaced out one circle per sin rhythm and the audience expectation that was set up by it. In the game, the seventh circle, violence, still manages to boast some really interesting interpretations of the source material. The first section is dedicated to those who committed violence against others, meaning murderers, serial killers and leaders who made their armies commit atrocities and genocide. In the poem, this layer is guarded by the giant minotaur of Gnosis, which the duo evades by Virgil insulting the half-bull half-man, which in turn makes it madly thrash around, giving them the opportunity to sneak past. Oddly enough, in the game, this section was not turned into a super epic violent mega battle with a skyscraper sized minotaur that you then, I don't know, disembowel with god knows what hellish device you turn against it or whatever, but it's rather focused on dexterity and wit. The minotaur itself only appears as a giant statue that we have to trick into chopping our path free for us with its massive battle axe. After that, we quite symbolically traverse rivers of blood with inhabitants of the Slayer drowning over and over again in it for all eternity, until we reach the second plateau, the Forest of Suicides, where those who commit violence against themselves get punished, and just like in the poem, grow into trees whose leaves then get eaten by harpies, causing them great pain until they of course instantly regrow, a positively Promethean punishment. Down here, Dante is surprised to encounter his own mother, as he had always believed that she'd perished from an illness, but as it turns out, she took her own life because of his father's cruelty. This is once again a complete deviation from book Dante's tale. But hey, luckily, we wield the power of forgiveness in the form of Beatrice's cross and can absolve her post-haste. My soul belongs to you after which we march on towards the third plateau of Circle 7, the Abominable Sands. Now, the circle of violence is one where it gets ideologically really questionable. See, the hierarchy of layers is composed in a way that the worse the sin you've committed, the deeper down in the pit you end up. Which means that Alieri consciously plays the circles and their sub-layers in the order of his personal judgement of the severity of each crime. See, the circle of violence is a very fascinating microcosm for the problems with this, because according to Alieri, for instance, murdering, killing, and even committing large-scale genocide, all of this is less bad than taking your own life. Because suicide is violence against yourself, and according to scripture, that's the gift God in his graceful infallibility bestowed on you, and thereby destroying this is indirect violence against God himself, and therefore worse than the Holocaust. And it gets better. The third plateau of violence, the abominable or burning sands, is where people who committed what's understood as violence against God himself are condemned to forever march on scorching hot sands and perpetually get showered by rains of fire. This includes things like sodomy, entailing things like being not heterosexual and not cisgender, because that's supposedly violating God's perfect idea of the traditional family yada yada and of course deserves eternal flames. Just beautiful. So yeah, according to the Inferno, being gay is literally a worse sin than the Holocaust itself. Values. But hey, disclaimer. Please mind that Alieri's interpretation of scripture in the Inferno was even repeatedly refuted by the Catholic Church itself, being like, hey wait, listen, being queer is not worse than mass murder, okay? We want to make that abundantly clear. We do not stand for this. Like, still deserves hell, but maybe the higher circle or something, I don't know. And it's here where I really appreciate the game at least attempting to subvert the ideological rigidness of the original work and adding this element of, well, in the game it's actually up to you who actually deserves to be down here. Dante's internal development over the course of the poem starts out with him being initially appalled and filled with pity at the sight of the cruel punishment inflicted on people, feeling remorse for their suffering, empathy. 
but he gradually turns into someone who vehemently nods along and wholeheartedly agrees with the pain with every hellish form of torture perpetrated because of how incredibly just and fair this entire sadistic pandemonium really is. Firmly convinced that every single soul down here truly deserves every last iota of the abuse inflicted on them for the rest of time. Or rather, until Judgment Day, when it turns out most tortures just become even worse, and then really for eternity. This whole notion of divine punishment, often merely for ways in which people are just different from the norm, branded as sins people have to be punished for, is something I've always abhorred with a passion. Punishment as a negative incentive to prevent people from doing bad things to begin with is a practice that's been proven again and again to not just be incredibly inefficient, but also to just make people worse. And many of the alleged sinful acts, like for instance the puritanical notion that lust in any form corrupts some kind of heavenly blessed virginity black. The oppressive teachings through and through which lastingly have rendered people in entire cultures miserable, regressive and morally tyrannized. It's horseshit dogmatic control. I could go on, but the gist is, I find the whole concept of hell and eternal damnation as a boogeyman tale to scare believers and acolytes into subservience over what the Catholic Church considers evil, not just comically evil in and of itself, but considering how much palpable damage it has caused culturally and in billions of cases individually over millennia incredibly sad and disheartening. And these notions are still painfully pervasive to this day, baked deep into every facet of our modern Christian-informed culture and by extension all over the world. <sighs> so in conclusion, I think a religious adherence to the underlying ideological message of the original work is not just unnecessary for me to enjoy this adaptation, giving me the option to go, wait a minute Holmes, what are you in for? Sodomy? Oh fucking hell, off to a better life with you. Be gay, do crime, smoke weed, occupy heaven is an incredibly satisfying middle finger to the toxic ideas purported in the original work. Yo, Dre, I got something to say. Inquisition. Because if we go by the moral conclusions of the original text, the idea that all and every punishment inflicted down in these nine circles of hell are the epitome of perfect righteous justice, that everything happening here is exactly as it should be, the very act of absolving people and thereby denying them the punishment they are supposed to receive in the eyes of God is an act of blasphemous rebellion. And that, my friends, puts an entirely different twist on the ostensibly shallow binary game mechanic of, hey, let's have Dante absolve or punish people to get XP and fill up an evil or good skill tree. But ultimately, it's the eighth circle, Malibol, the evil ditches where the pretense really starts to fall flat. The problems for Visceral came with the poem having Dante and Virgil traverse ten circular trenches surrounding a deep well in this circle, each of which is dedicated to a different variation of the uh, umbrella sin of fraud. Panderers and seducers are being forced to march, single file around the circumference of the trench, being constantly lashed by horned demons in the first bolia. Flatterers in the second are submerged in a river of shit and piss, yeah. Simoniacs, meaning those who sell church goods or offices for their own profit, in the third, are hung upside down with their feet on fire while having to read baptismal texts cut into the rocks in front of them. Many more different types of fraud are being put on display here, like thieves, hypocrites, grafters, deceivers, promoters of scandal and schism and so on, each receiving a punishment that Alieri found befitting for them. There's also one of my favorite unwittingly funny moments in the entire poem, which takes place in the fourth bolia, dedicated to astrologers, seers and sorcerers, people who attempted to pervert God's laws to divine the future. Their punishment is having their heads twisted around 180 degrees, exorcist style, and having to forever walk in a circle while not being able to look straight ahead. And it's here where Dante completely loses it, which always makes me cackle. He's witnessed incomparable suffering, people eternally boiled alive in pitch or liquid metal, people being burned by acid rain, skin torn off and decomposed in bile for eternity, and so many more. Yet when he comes across the sorcerers having to walk with their heads turned around, he feels like he can't take it anymore. Because for some reason, this is beyond cruel to him. Like 
tiny mini tangent, I promise, but I distinctly remember how my literature teacher in school could not stop laughing about this when we went through the eighth circle. Like, he literally had tears in his eyes about Dante just losing it completely here. <laughs> anyway, you can see how this circle, even though it felt like we're already way, way down near the end, would demand easily half the effort the game took so far in asset creation by the developers if it were to be realized in the same sprawling splendor as the circles we've encountered before. And the end result, no matter how much I twist and turn it, is a cop-out. In this adaptation, the Malibos have been replaced with ten little arena fights, with the deep abyss surrounding them, which is, I suppose, representing the well. Each section starts with a short, introductory narration by Beatrice, summarizing the corresponding sin in a single sentence with a camera pan of a mere statue that's meant to represent it. Then we have to platform our way across to the arena itself, and then face a gameplay challenge that has absolutely no ludonarrative connection with the events at hand. This can be something like get a combo of 100 successive hits, or kill 5 enemies exclusively with air attacks, or other achievement-like gameplay challenges in order to beat the plateau in advance. This is followed up by a short vertical climbing section to the next layer, save point, health and mana pool, and then the next arena awaits. It's very disjointed and immersion-breaking if you think that Beatrice now cares about us getting in a few achievements before the finale. Some of these arenas are pretty easy and satisfying, like blasting our way through incoming hordes with an infinite magic bar, while others can be pretty challenging and frustrating if you're not yet intimately familiar with the ins and outs of Dante's acquired skills and movesets, like having to stay in the air for a pretty extensive amount of time without once touching the ground. Now, Personally, I didn't find this layer all too off-putting in and of itself, because I really do enjoy the combat on its own, and especially upon my first playthrough, some of these challenges actually forced me to properly learn some of my abilities with greater finesse and granularity than I had until then. Like for instance, up until that point I still hadn't properly understood how to grab and toss enemies high up in the air, and how to use this to my advantage. It also really didn't take all that long, like around 35 minutes on my first playthrough, and my second I was already done within around 25 minutes. And to be honest, it was really this often detested segment of the game that led me personally to actually finally grasp some of the mechanics I just winged until that point, and I started thinking about it enough that I actually craved to play through the game all over again, and on a higher difficulty. Until that point, I hadn't even considered doing that. It feels a bit like the Mega Man habit of pitting you against all the bosses you've encountered over the course of the game in order to hone your skills before the final confrontation. So you could say that I don't have much to complain about it personally, although I do still understand how much of a letdown it is in tone and atmosphere compared to the unadulterated spectacle the game kept bombarding players with up until then. It really does feel like someone doing a five mile run who started out sprinting like there's no tomorrow but totally ran out of stamina somewhere in the latter half of the distance. I would have loved to see the vivid descriptions of the poem come to life in the game's breathtaking and epic presentation, not just an alibi statue per platform to show that you've done your homework in the most last minute fashion possible. After we've bested the Malibowl challenges, we're finally met with the long desired conclusion of the Beatrice arc. Dante faces the travestied hell version of Beatrice, but instead of answering all of his worldly misdeeds by projecting his failings onto higher powers and then slaughtering them as scapegoats in overbearing bloody carnage, <coughs> Dante realizes his responsibility for all the things that went bad in his life, in how he killed prisoners out of anger, the very act we started the game out with, which was the direct cause for her brother Francesco taking the blame for him and being executed for it. And after all these insights, Dante finally understands. I give up on this journey. My place is here in hell. Yours is in paradise. He understands that he was solely responsible for sins beyond redemption and that his place is down here in hell. And he accepts his real duty. And this act of sacrifice finally undoes the horrible transformation Beatrice underwent, and she's subsequently taken away to heaven by Jibril Farishta. Uh, I mean, the archangel Gabriel. You've done well, Dante. Now to get back to that dog ear in my page from earlier in the video. Beatrice saves Dante, not the other way around. That's the whole point, Doctor. 
We talked about how literary critics hated the notion that it's Beatrice who's supposed to save Dante, not the other way around, and that the game supposedly committed an act of pure heresy by flipping this one around. See, to me, this whole story was always about Beatrice saving Dante all along. The entire time, Dante is absolutely clueless about what he's done and what he's doing. He's a mindless brute, a pawn that's easily toyed with, manipulated, instrumentalized, whose only solution to problems he doesn't understand... I don't understand! ...is to keep chopping things to bits. <laughs> Isn't it how violence just begets violence? Beatrice, on the other hand, always saw through things. She clearly had a plan here when she bet her own soul for Dante's salvation. To force him to arrive at the self-realization and acceptance of his own sins, something he would never arrive at on his own, making herself his sole altruistic incentive for penance and thereby nudging him towards his only chance of absolution by fighting for her, because fighting is the only thing he knows how to do. To me, she always felt like the subversion of the damsel in distress, like Elaine Marley in Monkey Island who was set up to be the damsel for Guybrush to rescue, because this is a boy's adventure story, only to realize, what the hell are you doing, Guybrush? We had this under control all along. Or Elaine Marley in Monkey Island too, who supposedly gets captured again, so we sail after her, only that it turns out she didn't need our help again and had everything under control, and we futz things up for it all over again. Or Elaine Marley in Monkey Island 3, where... Oh no, wait, they actually did turn her into an actual damsel in distress once Ron Gilbert was out. Mm -hmm. Anyway, in Beatrice's case, it should be abundantly clear that without her deliberate intervention, Dante would have never had a chance in hell to redeem his own soul. She saved him. I don't understand. Your redemption is near. Wait! At long last, we finally descend to the lowest circle of hell, treachery, which is comprised of the frozen lake Kakaidas. The game definitely amps the spectacle back up towards the finale for the upcoming confrontation with Lucifer, the Lightbringer himself. After this deviation with Beatrice, who I want to add was a character based on nothing but a seriously unhealthy and creepy lifelong infatuation with Beatrice Portinari, who the writer Dante Alieri met when she was nine years old and after which she developed a thorough Madonna whore complex for her, obsessed with the platonic ideal of her for the rest of his days, seeing in her the most divine incarnation of purity. This continued even after she was married, not to him by the way, and even after her death at 25 years of age and when Alieri was long married himself, he would never stop swooning over perfect Beatrice. But I'm a creep. Anyway, so after the totally called for deviation from the original story's role of Beatrice is concluded, the game ties the bow and once again reunites with the events of the poem for the grand finale. Although in the Inferno, Lucifer presents with a humongously large body that towers over the eyes, which checks out, but he also has three mouths, each of which swallows and chews up Brutus, Cassius, and in their midst none other than Judas himself. Virgil and Dante then simply climb Lucifer's body to escape hell, while in the game it of course culminates with a big and epic boss battle in which we banish and re-imprison Lucifer deep into the ice for good. And it's a fight in which we have to grapple hook and dangle from his massive phallus in order to perform the final finishing move. Yeah. Nice car. Perfect. After this final takedown of the Lord of the Inferno, just like in the poem, Dante climbs through an outcropping of rock where he finds himself standing before the towering city of Purgatorio, which is a purgatory, the setting of the second part of the Divine Comedy. Being finally in tune with himself and his past, he tears the tapestry of sins off his chest and we see it disintegrate into a snake that slithers away. 
And in the final shot, we witness our protagonist marching towards purgatory accompanied by Beatrice's now liberated soul. And after this comes the single saddest moment of the entire game. Yeah, Dante's Inferno concluded in a strong implication that Visceral had planned to not end it here, but take us through the entire Divine Comedy. It was hinted at by writer Joshua Rubin in 2011 that he had been hired by Visceral for a game that was heavily implied to be a sequel to Dante's Inferno, but there's never been an official statement by Visceral themselves, which is rather safe to assume it was due to an internal gag order by a beloved publisher and license holder Electronic Arts, but that's conjecture. In the end, we're left with the fact that... It never happened. This might make a lot of die-hard Divine Comedy professors happy, but hey. I honestly would have loved to see this sometimes rough around the nose, sometimes cringe-worthily pubescent, but ultimately unique and very redeemable guilty pleasure take on the inferno to be continued all the way up to heaven. After all, how good is a video game series really if you don't get the chance to fight God at the end? Hey everyone, thank you for watching. If you're new to this channel and discovered me just with this video, hey, I'm Ragnar and I cover old games, horror games, indie games or combinations thereof and try bringing attention to games that have fallen into obscurity as well as outstanding indie titles that I want people to not miss out on. If this video made you want to play or replay Dante's Inferno yourself, remember I've added a document to help you emulate it on modern systems in the description of the video. Now before I leave it to it, a small but important plug. The work on my channel is primarily crowdfunded. Fan contributions are the main income source, the bread and butter of these videos, with multiple people contributing to writing, recording, editing, music, art, and things like having full English closed captions reliably ready at launch. If you'd like to help us out with that, then I'd greatly appreciate your support over on Patreon. It would make a tremendous difference. So thank you for considering, and thank you to everyone who supports me there already. And a special shout out this time goes out to... Terraflops. Dr. Haley, Isabella Colley, Chris Z, Cannon Ward, Hippo Hobbly, Max Macula, Chuck Taylor, Lillen B, Jin Hansen, Morgan K, Casper Rahm, David Zelenak, Lawrence E. Buben, Space Admiral Vivi, Swagam, Shannon Blue, Raul Blanco, Billy Lott, Isabella Stoner, Kelly Michelle Russell, Catherine Escobar, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Kerry George, Giselle Almonte, Glebin, Cordelia Crescendo, Kevin H. Yang, Rowan Crom, aka Daniel242172, Matt Gretton, Federico Rocha, Agustin Ortega, Kyle Lee, Nineball9606, Dana Rosa, Samantha, Refkins, Puka Princess, Boris Bugling, Neil Snowden, Ian Rhodes, Corey Marr, The Spiral Architect, Dylan Labonte, Chris Chan, Lair Dwakala, Nikot the Brave, Mura Casardes, Tabby, Uziel1447, Terry Collins, Bradley Douglas, Starina Abramson, Thomas Bona, Vincent Cavanaugh, Christine Monastère, and Beruga Dono. Until next time, ta-ta.